<laughs> Hi, y'all. I am climbing a mountain. I'm going to go inward. Uh, I'm Courtney Baker. I'm delighted to have been invited and happy, really happy to be here and kind of pretend that I can see you because it's really bright. Um, so from physical exertion to mental exertion, oh no, um, I am going to talk to you about reading and about literature and um, in some sense, what I do, and for I, all my students who are uh, students of literature, we're going to explain to your parents and to your friends who don't do that what it is that we do. Um, wandering through literature, the ends of reading. So what is my idea that I want to share with you? It's kind of an old school one, which is that we need to read more and to read and allow ourselves to wander through texts. So, to allow ourselves actually to get lost, because we're not actually getting lost. Um, to get away from a kind of model of thinking about uh, what we're going to get when we get through a work. So lately, I've gotten a lot of questions, or I'm increasingly getting questions from students when we get to the end of a beautiful poem or a novel that really kind of blows my mind as super expressionist, and I'll just be like floating on how awesome it is, and then I'll get this question that is, but what happened? And it'll kind of bum me out a little bit. Not that there's, there are wrong questions, but I want to, you to think about the other questions that one can ask, and to think that what happens when we read is that we've read, and to pay attention to that. And I want to make much of the fact that the quotation that is being used to headline this event comes from a poem and from a novel that is absolutely about wandering and is absolutely about a journey, the journey ending up being more important, perhaps, in terms of relationships, in terms of um, the kinds of personal and ethical discoveries than what ends up happening at the end. So why do we need wandering? Well, it allows us to turn inward. It allows us to actually become better people. That's a big claim. But it's a claim that we make in the humanities. It's like exercising. We get to practice our minds. We get to um, experiment with difficult problems that we hope we won't encounter in the real world. Um, and we get to really enjoy what it means to be conscious human beings, to appreciate the abilities and the special capacities that we have. So, to illustrate this, I'm going to make you, well, if this was my classroom, you're in luck. Now I have to do all of the reading and all of the answering and parsing of poems. So, yay you. <laughs> so we're going to read some poetry, guys. So I turn to illustrate this, this idea with the archetypal poetic wanderer, William Wordsworth, and his poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. So this is the first stanza. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So what do we notice here? Well, we notice that he's not He's an exceptional wanderer. He's actually wandering as a cloud. He's got this great vantage point. He's not just passing by these vistas, but he's able to see them from a great height, to take them all in at once. So this kind of unexpected, sudden, instantaneous view that is also afforded to him by being at a great height. And he's able to see what is otherwise might be considered a kind of banal thing, uh, a bunch of flowers dancing in the breeze. Now, that's not some kind of Disney, like they, they pull the roots up and do some kind of thing. No, this is actually just like them swaying back and forth, something that we might otherwise ignore or think is insignificant and not pay attention to. So where does this get him? Why is this significant? So he does this wandering. From the last stanza, 
For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills, and dances with the daffodils. So he ends up back on his couch. But that's OK, right? He doesn't want to stay a cloud, because that's weird. So he ends up back in on his couch, where he gets to, again, be alone and hang out and think. And his inward eye turns back to those moments where he's been able to wander. And he's experiencing bliss, right? And his heart is filled with pleasure. And it's the mind that has produced this pleasure and that allows him to go back to represent to himself this experience of seeing beautiful nature in its simplest but um, purest form. So that's all very lovely. Congratulations, you went through part of a Wordsworth poem. You get like half credit. Um, we might want to think about what are the conditions that would allow us to wander. Reading is arguably available to all of us. We all do it, or hopefully, ideally, all of us do it. But this kind of wandering, this ability to sit with a text, to think this deeply, and also to wander literally, require a certain set of conditions. And I want to, in the second part now, to talk about and to think about well, what are the conditions that allow us to fully explore our capacity as human beings. That's the metaphor I'm working with here. So another poem, a more recent poem by Nikki Finney. The poem is entitled Left. It's from her recent volume called Head Off and Split. The woman with cheerleading legs has been left for dead. She hot paces a roof four days, three nights, her leaping fingers Helium arms rise and fall, pulling at the weak old baby in the bassinet, pointing to the 82-year-old grandmother, fanning and raspy in the New Orleans Saints folding chair. Well, let's get to the obvious first. You can probably recognize the image that's being depicted here. Those who were abandoned and left for dead on the rooftops during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. There's a very eerie and important resonance with the kind of wandering that is permitted and glorified in Wordsworth poem. Here we have, by contrast, a very limited space, a roof, pacing, four days, three nights. She has a lovely amount of time in which to wander, but she doesn't have the space in which to do it. And we can see from her cheerleading legs that She's eager and does have the capacity for it, but she's restricted, she's restrained. And we get this, even this image of the folding chair, this image of an impoverished reclining device, that was a robot word, that echoes Wordsworth's more comfortable couch. So let's keep thinking about the conditions. What would allow someone to wander, to fully explore and to appreciate the capacity for being human. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. This is the second verse. Three times a day, the helicopter flies by in a low crawl. The grandmother insists on not being helpless, so she waves a white handkerchief that she puts on and takes off her head toward the cameraman and the pilot, who remembers well the art of his mirror-eyed posture in his low-flying helicopter. Bong son, dong ha, play ku, chu lai, he makes a slow Viet Cong dip and dive, a move known in rescue as the observation pass. Who can wander and who can't is not arbitrary. And we have in this image a very interesting contrast, right? We have someone who is wandering like a cloud, the helicopter, who gets to take in the scene, who has the freedom of movement that he's he's enjoyed before. But we, what he's viewing this time are not daffodils. He's viewing people, people who he's seen before in this landscape known as rescue, in Vietnam and now in the United States under Hurricane Katrina. So, so what, how can we understand? What determines these conditions for who gets to wander and who doesn't? The poem itself, gives us a cue 
in this eeny, meeny, miny, mo, which you probably recognize. You may not recognize its original context. It's just going to be a whoa moment. Just wait for it. What is the song the children sing when doorway lilacs bloom in spring and the schools are loosed and the games are played that were deadly earnest when earth was made? Hear them chattering shrill and hard after dinner time out in the yard as the sides are chosen and all submit to the chance of the lot that shall make them it. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you are it. It's a poem by Rudyard Kipling that appears in 1923 from a volume for scouts and guides, the, the epic wanderers, right? Let's pay attention to the casual racism of this and also to the fact that Rudyard Kipling is inserted in a kind of imperial logic. We have a view just from the words, what these children look like, right? And who can be chosen as it? It's race, it's imperialism. We can understand the ability to wander as being an ability that is afforded through relations to power, to resources. So what are we going to do about that, is the question that I want to ask you. Reading is great. Reading is fundamental, as we have been told, the great sages tell us. Well, we need to pay attention to what we can do and ensure that others have the ability to wander as well. Why? Because poetry is essential, because reading is essential. The ability to wander makes us better pe people, and more than that, it is a fundamental right. As Audre Lorde tells us, poetry is the way we help give name to the nameless so it can be thought. The farthest horizons of our hopes and fears are cobbled by our poems, carved from the rock experiences of our daily lives. It's through wandering, through literature, through contemplation, through thinking about the ends, not the end, the purpose, but not the end game, that we can make a better world and we can make ourselves better people. So now that we are in a condition, in an environment, in which being constrained, being limited in our wandering has come to be a representative experience for those of us who are marked by race, who are marked by class, who are marked by gender, who are marked by sexuality, we need, especially now, to attend to who has the privilege to wander. And to exemplify what good can come from wandering, I want to close with a poem about and by someone who knows more than anyone what it means to have one's wandering curtailed. It's a poem by the prison poet, Etheridge Knight, who wrote this poem while he was imprisoned. Night music slanted, light strike the cave of sleep. I alone tread the red circle and twist the space with speech. Come now, Etheridge, don't be a savior. Take your words and scrape the sky. Shake rain on the desert. Sprinkle salt on the tail of a girl. Can there anything good come out of prison? Can there anything good come out of prison? Can there anything good come out of being confined? Well, only if at one point you're allowed to wander. I think we can answer this with, can there anything good come out of prison? With yes. What can come out is a man who is not lost, but who is all the better for his literary wanderings. So I want to leave you with this idea, this notion, that we can all be improved by our wanderings, but that with wandering comes some responsibility. And be aware of the privilege that you have, this space, especially if you're a student, that we are in a very privileged space. And let us try to contribute to an environment in which wandering is not only valued, but afforded for everyone. So thank you for letting me wander.